Um, and first of all, I'd like to say a thank you to, to Luke and Pooja and the board for a marvellous job they've done in, in ensuring the survival of the TSA. As you probably know, during COVID, a lot of charities our size went to the wall, as did a lot many, many smaller ones. Um, and the TSA has not only survi um, survived the sort of problems of COVID, but it has come out stronger the other end. So that's, so thank you. Um, and then research. So we've, we've had, we've got some really exciting um, things on the horizon. And I'm very pleased to be able to tell you about the research. So next slide, please, Luke. Um, so this is um, where we've come from. Um, in TSC, of course, there are a number of very serious complications that were occurring, um, and we've conquered some of them. So brain saga, um, we now have a very good treatment for in, in Everolimus and Sirolimus. Um, we can prevent kidney bleeding, providing we diagnose AMLs and treat them. Um, before they cause a problem, and even after, a uh, lot of times, um, LAM is is essentially conquered, providing its people are under surveillance and it's diagnosed. Um, the, the facial rash, um, again, uh, topical sarodemus is, is a marvelous treatment for that. Um, and the the fun, there's a little bit of it's not universally available on the NHS everywhere yet, and Nice is considering. Um, that and, and funding it, um, but hasn't given a decision. But those centres that have traditionally been providing it of, uh, and therefore paying for it are being able to swap their funding to the new treatment. So um, that's good. And we're in the other places we're still battling and will probably need some help. Uh, so the two main biggest problems, uh, as I see it, are resistant epilepsy. And we're about halfway there in finding reasonable treatments, but only halfway there. And I'll talk about that a bit. And also tanned. Uh, but we've got some um, hope on the horizon for tanned in general. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm a kidney specialist, so I'm just going to give a little bit about kidneys um, and, and the things that we've still yet to do. Uh, talk about epilepsy, um, segue into the cost of new drugs just to explain why they're so expensive when they first come out and then finish on, on the subject of TAND. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and just to highlight the kid, uh, things, so M Everlimus and Sirolimus has been very successful in dealing with AMLs and this was our uh, report on patients from attending St George's um, it, since then, the results have continued to be good. Um, the cutoff was was last year for the data, um, and indeed, none of our patients have had any bleeding after starting treatment. Next slide, please. Um, and the dose um, uh, that we've the standard dose for starting people on everlim is, is five milligrams. Now, in the literature and the patient data sheet it says 10 and when you start on 10 you get a lot more side effects in in number of people um, and, and the reason 10 was picked is because that was the oncology dose uh, and that was those starting those picked before we knew much better um, so that so still people who are not ex doctors who are not experienced may start people, patients on 10 but I think it's entirely okay for patients to say actually I only want to start with five and then see and you'll see from this that we have had to increase the dose in a, in a tenth of patients, but in 25%, we've decreased the dose and, and, that, and sometimes halved it and halved it again. So um, it, it's, it, everyone varies into how much they need, but uh, you need to be able to measure it in the blood, but not very much um, if you're treating AMLs. Um, and also if you're treating SEGA. Um, and at those levels, it also has some beneficial effects on skin. Um, it's a bit of a different story with um, with seizures, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. There is a cost. I mean, you do get side effects from 
Everimus, but in and they're very common when you first started and mouth ulcers are the commonest but in general they're usually pretty minor and they usually by three six months side effects are, are, are quite rare um, next slide please um, so the another uh, main issue in, in kidneys is, is cysts and there's two types of, of cysts two main types um, polycystic kidney disease, which is due to um, a lesion across the end of the chromosome 16 that takes out the TSC2 gene and the polycystic kidney disease gene. And that's still a, a problem where we're navigating what the best treatments are for that. But we know treating blood pressure very early on is important. Um, and then others, what we call simple cysts, that sometimes can affect kidney function, sometimes and, and oftentimes not, and usually um, aren't, don't cause uh, physical problems in themselves. But the way they form is very interesting scientifically. Because if we'll see from these two big green circles, um, the cells in purple are supposed to represent um, TS cells with double hits in their either TSC1 or TSC2 gene. And the green circle, cells are normal cells that have been misdirected by chemicals, EVs and or extra uh, um, uh, so, uh, ex, their packets of um, cytokines or chemical messengers that are produced by the cells and cast out into the environment around them and they misdirect other cells into forming cysts. Either cyst made up entirely normal cells or cyst made up half and half and that mechanism of, of the EVs the cytokine messengers causing trouble is probably part of the reason why some of the problems in the brain occur as well so it also gives us an extra potential way of, of preventing problems not just blocking the mTOR um, pathway but also blocking the um, extravesicular um, key uh, messengers. Um, so that's something that's it's ongoing. Um, next slide, please. And this um, slide is to talk about kidney impairment and kidney failure in TSC, which does occur, but is now rare and getting much rarer um, year by year. The line in yellow is normal people. That is when you're people with normal kidneys. And as you can see, as people age, around the age of, of 40 to 45, your normal kidneys stop repairing and start dying off, as, and that's happening to all of us. Um, but they don't um, become significantly impaired until later, much later in life, as, as we and all our organs wear out. In TSC, um, there was uh, about 41% you know, of people were getting premature impairment of kidney function, um, which a lot of which was due to AMLs and bleeding from AMLs and the treatment necessary to stop it. Um, as with the era of mTOR inhibitors since then, that, that blue line's got a lot nearer the yellow line and things are much improved. We're not completely there yet, um, partly because some of the cells that in the, in, in the first 35 years of life that repair the kidney turn into TS cells rather than into repair cells. Um, and so the earlier we can prevent things, the better that's going to be. Um, and we will see how that plays out in the, with mTOR inhibitors and other treatments in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, but as promised, let's go on to epilepsy. Uh, next slide. And um, this was the Everly, trial of Everlimus treating refractory epilepsy. You see the black line at the top shows what happens to people who are on placebo. And there's a kind of 15% improvement, um, which unfortunately doesn't usually last that long in, when you're on placebo, but it's very common in all drug trials. You always get a 15% placebo response. Uh, for reasons we don't fully understand. But more importantly, the blue and the red lines represent the people taking Everlimus at various doses to have high blood levels. Um, and it was thought that the um, 
a higher dose, the red line, would be more effective than the blue do line dose because that was designed to give it much, the, only about a third of everolimus crosses from the blood into the brain. So you need high levels in the blood in order to affect the brain. And that's the problem with all mTOR inhibitors, sirolimus included. Um, but in fact, as you can see there, as the trial went on, the people taking the low, lower doses started to catch up, but it's still quite a high dose compared to what you'd give for an AML or a Sega. So although as, um, there was quite a good response of, um, and better in the younger people were than, the, than adults, but um, there was a whole range, not um, it was only at maximum about did about 50% of people respond in terms of improving their epilepsy on everolimus. And because of that, and because of the side effects from the higher doses, um, everolimus has um, become a less popular treatment by neurologists for seizures. However, next slide, please. If we look at anti-epileptic drugs, um, and the typical thing that's been found again and again with new anti-epileptic drugs is if someone seizures, if when you give the first drug, about 50% of people with seizures will become seizure free. When you add in a second drug, it's up to about 65%. Um, and this is seizures from all causes, not just TS. But the more drugs you add in, the less effective it is, or the more drugs you try, the less effective it is. So by the time you get up to four, the fourth or fifth choice, only two or three percent are becoming seizure free, um, and that's always been the case with ordinary conventional anti-epileptic drugs. Whereas, if we go back a slide, please, Luke. Uh, not on the other way. Oh no, backwards. Back, back, and back again, and again. Perfect, thank you. Um, so, whereas you see, there's a, at least from the old, older people, there's at least a thirty percent response, and then and the younger people a fifty percent response, and that's hugely different from adding another conventional anti-epileptic drug. So, I think everolimus will slowly began to be tried much more commonly by neurologists once they get used to handling um, the adverse events and ways to improve it. Now, in our clinics, uh, St. George's Clinic, where we, we treat mainly people with SAGAs and um, AMLs, we find that some of those, even on low dose their seizures improve. And, and if we push up the dose a bit to as much as they can tolerate, that more have improvements. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing uh, uh, thing that we're trying. Uh, so next slide, and again, next slide. Thank you. Um, so cannabidiol um, or Epidiolex. So this was the original trial um, from the American centers. And as you'll see in this trial, interestingly in the gray boxes, placebo had slightly more effect temporarily, but then it wore off. Uh, but the people on cannabidiol um, did much better. So they, again, had significant in the, um, in the treatment period, um, which was only 16 weeks. There was, seemed to be a 50% improvement on low-dose cannabidiol. In maintenance treatment, some people had dropped out, which is why the apparent improvement improves. So it's probably about the same. Um, and the higher dose um, was, is, was no more effective than the lower dose. So nowadays, um, we only go up to the lower dose, but neuro because of potential side effects, neurologists will start at a much lower dose than 25, usually something like five milligrams per kilogram per day, and then just slowly titrate up. Uh, but again, this is a much bigger response than another conventional anti-epileptic drug. So that was really good news. Um, next slide, please. And uh, thanks to Pooja for originally making this, this slide, and I've altered it slightly on with the latest drugs. And you see in the left-hand column, there's a TSC-related epilepsy. 
um, and there's new drugs in different phases. There's genoxalone, um, basimaglutarant, um, sorry, and um, something from Longboard Pharma that hasn't yet got a proper name. All of these look promising. Um, whether they'll do better than the usual next new anticonvulsant, we don't know yet, but but they may do. Um, and early signs seem to be good. Um, Flemfuramin's down there, um, one from Ovid Pharma, and Astroscape down the bottom in the very early stages. But you'll see under fate on this also something from Aovian Pharma, AV078, which I'll talk about again in a moment. And also, of course, HIFTOR is, is the topical sarodimus cream that um, comes from Japan that um, NICE is trying to decide whether to fund for everybody, um, whether that will leave any place for another uh, topical sarodimus treatment is probably doubtful. If we the first one funded will probably be then given to everybody. And, and on, the, on the far right, the Epidiolex trial, which um, the TSA was um, crucial in helping design, um, that's to look at um, improving um, TAN with Epidiolex. And in all these other, uh, the TSA is also having um, input into the design of these other trials, which is very helpful. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so to onto a the reason I want to just highlight the um AV078 is because it's very exciting. It's an mTOR inhibitor. It's an mTOR inhibitor that crosses the blood brain barrier that can be used in a much higher dose because it only blocks one mTOR pathway and not there's two mTOR pathways. Um blocking one of them causes most of the side effects and blocking the other one causes most of the beneficial effects. And this is the one that blocks that one we want to block the causes benefit. So in it's uh, it's been used in animal work and it's been used in a human um, volunteer study uh, that was done in Australia. And then the next bit is to try it in a group of um, adults um, and then children with refractory epilepsy to see whether in what's called a phase two study. So that's, does is there any actual effect and are there any severe side effects? But it, in order to really establish it, it will probably need a phase three study, i.e. using it against placebo um, as an add-on treatment to people's already, uh, the anti-epileptics are already taking. The, um, we've, on behalf of the TSA, I've been talking to Aovian a lot, and they've now made direct contact with, with Puja, which is great. Um, and the study will, this the initial phase two study will certainly be in the UK, in some European centres as well, and possibly in the United States. But it's good that it's coming to the UK as, as a first um, trial. And that's entirely due to... Um, having good relations with the company who are developing it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then just to go on to talk a bit about early intervention studies, um, there was a lot of hope that because vergabatrin is very effective in um, for infantile spasms and indeed for focal spasms um, once they've been diagnosed, um, that if you gave it very, very early, that it might prevent um, epilepsy altogether. And these, um, there were two big stoppers, the European one, Epistop, and Prevent, the American one. Um, and they unfortunately didn't show that it would prevent the onset of seizures. Um, and there's a, a nice commentary by the two main research leaders from Serge so Jorciak from um, the European study and, and um, and it, Dr. Bebin or Professor Bebin um, from America, but it it did show something even probably as exciting that what they did was people who were diagnosed with TS very early in infancy or or in the womb from finding um, rhabdomomas on fetal ultrasound were then um, watched like a hawk from day one, 
um, split into two groups. One who had treatment as soon as they developed either seizures or an EEG that suggested they were about to, or before they developed any problems at all. And it clearly showed that the level, the number of developing refractory seizures and the number of developing some aspects of TAN, like um, intellectual impairment or autism, were much lower um, in the in all of the people who had treatment. Um, and compared to historical controls. And this was because the average time of diagnosing the seizures was early on. So the message to, to us and to the scientific community is we need to be able to diagnose TS from at least the day of birth or before um, so that we can look for any problems like seizures and treat things straight away. And that applies to both autism, which is much better if it's treated early, um, as well as seizures. And developing seizures can cause autism as well. So obviously there's a double benefit from early diagnosis. In the UK, um, fetal ultrasound is classically done at 20 weeks um, and it shows up and about 20% of people with TS will have cardiac rhabdos at 20 weeks of age in the womb. Um, but if you delay the fetal ultrasound or do another one later, then you can pick up to 50%. Um, so that's one easy win for us once we can persuade the NHS to play ball. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then um, Darcy Kruger in Cincinnati has been leading studies looking at using Everolimus very early. And Everolimus has the um, extra advantage of the fact that um, it's less likely to cause severe side effects and is more likely to be effective in the very young. Um, and it also gets at the underlying problem of uh, by inhibiting uh, progression of TS in the brain by inhibiting mTOR. So um, it and the stop one and stop two studies were observational. They were looking at people already starting Everolimus for other reasons, like they had a Sega or a rhabdo that, cardiac rhabdo that needed treatment. Um, the next stage uh, um, is TSC steps. And this is a, a study starting infants on Everolimus as soon as they develop any hint that they're going to get by a, a seizure, such as an abnormal EEG or early seizures in the first few weeks of life or first few months of life um, and if you wanted to look at what it involves it's on a website called clinicaltrials.gov if you google clinicaltrials.gov it will take you to this um, website which allows public access and this describes all the trials that are going on in TSC uh, but TSC steps is about halfway through but um, and we will, we will wait to see what the results show but it I suspect it's going to show that Everolimus, given very early on, is, is very effective at helping prevent seizures and altering the natural history or, or how TSC turns out for most people. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so next, oh, that's a picture from South Africa near where Petrus lives. Uh, Petrus Therese. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the cost of new drugs. Um, the, the, a little bit of background first. It used to be quite cheap to bring new drugs to market, but a couple of fundamental things stopped that. Uh, first was the thalidomide scandal, um, which was a drug in the UK. It produced by uh, was licensed by the Distillers Company, and it was a very it's a very good sleeping tablet and is also now very good at helping people with myeloma uh, which helps treat but it as many of you would know it caused terrible birth defects when given to uh, expecting mothers um, and the reason it did that uh, is because there wasn't really much in the way of animal safety testing before it was from the public and very little in the way of proper trials and so it almost single-handedly helped start the cascade of making the uh, think the process of finding 
and testing new drugs much much safer and now there's lots of um, you have to test show things work in the test tube with cellular models you have to use animal models um, and then you have to do lots of um, uh, human testing in specific, specific groups and you go through phase one two and three trials before it can be uh, it can be produced by the public um, the other thing that's been going on um, is illustrated by beta blockers beta blockers were the first one of the first most useful treatments for high blood pressure and they were designed specifically in 1964 um, when uh, and, and they were uh, the beta receptor which is a thing that helps on nerve endings which, or on blood vessels that raises your blood pressure um, that was worked the structure that was worked out scientifically and beta blockers were then scientifically designed to block it um, nowadays um, we've kind of worked through all those easy targets of, of in mostly so it, it's quite difficult to find new drugs and so you have to screen hundreds and hundreds or thousands of potential things before you find one that may have a good effect and those two things together safety and, and the difficulty of finding them makes finding new drugs very expensive next slide please um, and on average it costs 880 million dollars to um find a new drug and work it up and then market it and so someone has to cough up the either private investors or a drug company um, you know just shy of a billion dollars before we get a new drug and if you look at the figures to recoup that over five years um, where you'd have to earn five and the reason i picked five years is because by the time you have found the, the the molecule or the potential new drug patented it and then got it to market you've run out of the patent almost you only have about five years left it, and except in special circumstances so drug companies look to recoup all the money within the next five years when they launch it so that's 176 million a year but in order to get 176 million back you need to divide it by the number of people who are going to have it so for tsc um if we look at the figures there's about a million people with TSC worldwide which about a quarter live in developed countries who have enough money to pay the sort of money that a drug company would need to recoup its costs and say if a fifth of people with TSC in those countries needed treatment um, to recoup that money that they, the drug company would have to charge three and a half thousand dollars a year per patient and that's just to break even it's not to make a profit or or to um, build up funds for new investments. So that's just a short explanation of, of why new drugs cost so much. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but let's go on to TAND. Um, now, just to remind you, TAND stands for TSC Associated Neuropsychiatric or Neuropsychological Disorders. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, Petrus de Vries um, did this survey in the UK in 2010 and found that 90% of people with TSC will have some problems with TAND, but less than a fifth of those actually had any kind of evaluation or guidance. So it's a big assessment and treatment gap. So since then, he and others have been trying to find ways to um, bridge the gap and, and deliver treatments to people. Next slide, please. Um, and one of the problems is, is that TAND is so many, has so many different parts to it. So he and, and Lauren Leclesio have done, did a lot of work in sort of breaking this down into different clusters of, of problems. Um, and this is from uh, one of their early papers and, and really divides um, TAND into the different aspects and how it affects people. And, and not everyone has all of these, of course, and some people have it's much, have some bits that are worse than others, and some people have almost none. But on average, everyone has some. Next slide, please. Um, and it, 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 or put it more simply, I mean, it includes learning disability, um, autistic spectrum disorder, other 
difficult behaviors, insomnia, anxiety, depression. Um, and we know that from those early prevention studies I was talking about, that vergabatrin and mTOR inhibitors, we know, do help prevent TAND if given very early. Um, mTOR inhibitors, we know that from case reports, but we're and, and also from those stop one and stop two studies that were done. Um, but uh, we need to, to know a lot more about what we can do to, to help TAND and also about what is available um, because not there, there are simple treatments for a lot of things for anxiety and depression that people never receive because they're not properly diagnosed. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and one of the problems, of course, is TAND is complex, and this is a, a concept that uh, Professor De Vries was was showing that it's like looking at a starry sky at night. But next slide, please. If you break it down into recognizable patterns, i.e. the TAND clusters, you start picking off which of these are more important for any one person with TSC, and so which to concentrate on first and what treatments are available for that. Next slide, please. Um, and that's the whole uh, concept behind the Tandem and the Tandem app. It's first of all to kind of explain, to, uh, and it's done as, as a self questionnaire where people go through and work out what their main issues are. And it's to explain that that's what's going on, but also to kind of validate that this is a problem and, and and it's a recognized problem. It's not just, uh, they're not alone in that. Um, it's useful to document what's going on so it can be shared with you know, family, uh, teachers, medical advisors. Um, and there is the bit that's now been added is advice about what can be done about some of those aspects. Um, a lot of TAND can't yet be effectively treated, but some can. Um, and in, in the bits that can't be, it will highlight what research is needed. Um, and it, doing that, it makes the problem visible, very visible to people that we need to go to and say, um, we need funding for this research. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so oh, this is just a probably too complex an overview of, of, of the early work we did in TAN, which was to, you know, work, use an app to, uh, to people could, f families and, and people with TSE could fill it in themselves, work out what was going on, and then have some links to things that would help. Um, next slide, please. It took a long time because COVID hit us in the middle. Um, and, um, that and also because the first app developer who had a three year contract was completely useless and had to be got rid of eventually. Uh, but the people who are working on TAN come from all over or on the Tandem app and on the Tandem project come from all over the world, as you'll see from this map. Um, from the UK, I'm really, as a sort of TSA and parent rep in this project, uh, Dr. Stacey Bissell is, is the professional from the UK who's working on it, but there are a mixture of, of professionals of different uh, parts of involvement in TAND, plus also um, parents. Next slide, please. Um, so the um, TANDEM app is finally going to launch sometime early into next year. Um, it's already available on the um, TAN and, um, consortium uh, website and on the TAN toolkit website. And those are the, these are the references here, where people can do the TAN SQ. SQ stands for uh, self-reported questionnaire checklist, and then look at the toolkit and see what, for their main issues, what things are available at the moment. Um, and if next slide, please. Uh, oh, and next one. Ah, good. So, so once you've gone through the, the um, app, it comes up with a sort of 
thing on the uh, on the right hand side it shows what you score for each cluster and therefore you can and then you can pick out what's important for you um and start looking at the resources for that next slide please um and so the clusters are, are along the bottom here in the in the colored boxes so i'm pointing to it but you can't see me pointing um but if you look along the bottom of the slide um so they're like the autism like cluster on one side to the psychosocial cluster on the next and for each of those there's this description of what in that cluster what things to look for and then some resources of, of what to do and this is from the tantoolkit.org app uh tantoolkit.org or website sorry but it, it will also be on the app um what we need to do in the uk is find what other local resources we have so we can add them to the tan toolkit uh, next slide please um so hopefully uh we'll be able to do this as a project with the tsa and with the ts clinics and um that will it will help disseminate information on, on what treatments are available and we can help then feedback to the tandem research group to tailor the the app to the uk um if we want to look at how well effective this is um and also to underscore what areas of a tan need urgently need more research next slide please and that's it for um my talk but i think 2025 is going to be a good year um the i didn't say but the tandem app um they had a big grant to uh start it off from the tsa um the tsa and the belgian foundation together um were the two uh, organizations that allowed it to uh, become a reality so thank you tsa 